Have you ever heard of the secretary problem? Because if you haven't, it can actually help you solve some of life's most important questions, such as when you're dating, which date should you pick for a potential relationship? And when you're looking for a house, which one should you choose to put a deposit down on? Believe it or not, mathematicians and scientists have come up with provably optimal strategies for each of these problems, and understanding them can actually provide the platform and the key to figuring out a huge range of everyday life's issues. So in this video, we're going to be looking at a few concepts that when understood, not only gives you a definitive answer to some of these problems, but also they contain far-reaching implications. The inspiration for this video comes from the book Algorithms for Life, and I'll leave a link down below if you're interested in checking that out. So the first of these concepts is called optimal stopping. And all this means is that if you're given a large list of items to go through, how do you know when to stop looking and settle on that particular item, or to continue searching because there's something potentially better. A more concrete example of this is often referred to as the secretary problem. And what this means is that imagine you're trying to employ a secretary and you're given a list of say 100 secretaries or 100 applicants, how do you know which applicant to actually accept or to continue looking given that if you have to reject a candidate, then you can't go back on that particular decision. In other words, you have to interview each applicant one at a time and after each interview, you have a decision to make, which is, do you hire that secretary there and then and discard the rest of the queue? Or do you say no and move on to the next applicant? So as I hinted to earlier, there's actually a mathematically correct way of doing this that maximizes your chance of hiring the correct or best secretary. So before we get into it, let's look at a strategy that's not so good and it involves pure randomness. So imagine that you were to number each secretary in order from the time that you interview them from 1 to 100 and then put those numbers from 1 to 100 into a hat and pick out one particular value and that would be the person that you hire, this would give you a 1% chance of hiring the best possible applicant. Not only this, but it would also give you the same chance, a 1% chance of hiring the worst possible applicant. So overall, there's no distinction between the best and the worst and the probability of you hiring the best is very low. Now let's look at a process that I think most people would intuitively follow, which is you go through the list one by one until you find one that you particularly like and then you assume that that's the best you're gonna get or that it's unlikely you're gonna get someone much better. So let's imagine you get to the second candidate and that second candidate is a lot better than the first, so your gut tells you that maybe this is a good way to go and you should hire this particular person. The only problem is, if you do a probabilistic or statistical analysis, you'll realize that because you're only two candidates in, you only have a one in 50 chance of actually picking the best candidate. So in other words, there's a very good chance that the best person for the job is someone who you haven't yet interviewed. So clearly it's not a good idea to make a decision too quickly because there's a very good chance that the best person for the job is someone who you haven't interviewed. But equally, it's a bad idea to wait too late because let's say you get to the 98th, 99th or 100th candidate, there's a very good chance that the best person was the person who you've already interviewed. And because you've already dismissed them, you can't go back on your word and you're left to settle with the last candidate. So science and maths shows us that the best possible strategy for finding the best candidate is called the 37% rule. What this means is that you should spend your time interviewing the first 37% of candidates and keeping track of the best possible candidates so far, even though that you've already missed out on them and that you can't actually hire them. Then you go through the remaining 63% of the candidates one by one until you reach someone who's better than the best candidate that you've come across so far and you immediately hire them. What's interesting about the 37% rule is that there are two reasons why the number 37 is relevant. And the first is obviously that you should spend the first 37% looking at the potential candidate so far. And also it's because there's a 37% chance of you finding the optimal candidate in that particular group. In other words, just by following the 37% rule, it gives you a 37% chance of hiring the best possible secretary out of the full list of 100. Another consequence of this is that when compared to the random strategy that I mentioned earlier, that had a 1% chance of finding the best candidate and a 1% chance of finding the worst, in this particular instance, even if you don't actually land on the best possible applicant, there's a very good chance that you've got someone who's almost as good. I think one of the real strengths of the 37% rule is its flexibility in that it can be applied to a huge range of different problems, but also it can be modified in different ways to adapt to that particular problem, for example, dating. 
So you might be thinking that the process of dating sounds a little bit like the process of hiring a secretary in that you have to go through each date one at a time until you find someone that you're actually happy with. But what's different about dating is that you don't have a list of all the potential dates that you could have over the course of your life. So instead, we can modify this particular example and instead of being 37% of a list of say 100 potential applicants, instead it could be 37% over the time frame which you expect to be dating. So for instance, if you expect to be dating from the ages of 18 to 40, then 37% of that particular time frame is 26.1 years. So what this means is that you should spend the time up to 26.1 years figuring things out, meeting people, engaging what kind of standard are you aiming for and what kind of candidates are actually available. This helps you form benchmark for what a good candidate actually looks like. And then when you come across someone who meets or exceeds that particular threshold, then you settle down and turn that particular situation provided you have that opportunity into a long-term relationship. So here are some examples for where the 37% rule actually applies. And that's when you're looking for a house, when you're dating, when you're looking for a job, when you're parking, or when you're hiring someone. There is a variation of this problem that applies when you have an objective way of measuring how good that particular candidate performs in the area that you care about. So let's say that in the case of a secretary, you care about how fast they can type and you're able to measure this based on percentile. This gives you additional information that when you interview each secretary, you can check what percentile they are at typing, which let's say is the only metric that you actually care about. And then based on the particular idea that we mentioned earlier, along with this particular data, you can actually form an opinion that gives you a 58% chance of finding the best possible candidate. This is called the threshold rule. And if you're interested in learning more about this, then definitely check out the book, Algorithms for Life. So now we're gonna move on to a new collection of problems or a new concept, which is called Explore Exploit. Similar to the secretary problem being a concrete example of optimal stopping, the concrete example of Explore Exploit is called the multi-armed bandit problem, which gets its name from a casino slot machine called the one-armed bandit. The rough idea behind Explore Exploit is that when you're deciding between lots of different options and you need to choose whether you want to stick with something that you already know or try something new, which strategy should you employ in order to get the best of both worlds? Here to explore means to choose something that you already didn't have prior information about and to exploit means to utilize the information that you already have and come up with an informed decision. So moving back to the multi-arm bandit problem, what this actually is is that imagine that you have to choose between a bunch of slot machines in a casino and each one has different odds of paying out or winning. So in one case, there might be a 30% chance of winning and in another, there might be a 50% chance. How do you know without having the prior information, which slot machine are you better off spending most of your time playing or exploiting? Again, like the secretary problem, there are a lot of solutions that aren't particularly useful or helpful because they don't actually land very good strategies. Suboptimal strategies involve picking one at random each time you're about to play a game or picking one at random at the start and sticking with that for the rest of the duration. Instead, a particularly effective idea that actually helps optimize and solve this particular problem is called the Gittins Index. What this relies on is the idea of discounting. So you should value the present more highly than the future. And this makes sense in other contexts too. So for example, if you're trying to choose dinner each day for the rest of the year, then it makes more sense to prioritize tonight over choosing something that happens in say six months time. Another idea is that when balancing favorite experiences with new ones, nothing matters as more as the interval over which we plan to enjoy them. So what the Gittins Index actually gives you is a table of values that lets you know when you should stick with the current option or you should move on to something better. And depending on how the results go, those particular values shift and then you're able to make a more informed decision. And each decision you make becomes less impactful because you've collected more information. At the start, you don't have much to go on, so you should favor exploration, but as you collect more information, then it makes sense to lean towards something that you already know to be more valuable. Another way of solving this is with what's called upper confidence algorithms. And how this works is that imagine back in our casino example, in one case, you've tried one particular slot machine 10 times and five of those times you got a payout and five of the times you didn't. And in another instance, you tried a particular slot machine twice. 
and in one of those instances there was a payout and in one of them that there wasn't. On the surface it might seem like there's a 50% chance of payout on both cases but in the second case you actually have less information to go on so you should actually lean towards more exploration. Based on the prediction that the second one has a 50% payout rate, your margin for error is actually a lot wider. Therefore, there's a chance it could be a lot better than 50%, but there's also a chance that it could be a lot worse than 50%. But what an upper confidence algorithm actually does is you should lean towards the thing that has the best upper bound. In other words, in the absence of evidence, optimism is your best strategy to prevent or avoid regret. What I really like about these algorithms is that they don't just offer solutions, but they actually also offer insights. One example is that when you've got time on your side, you should lean towards exploration. And this is actually true in the real world, because when we look at people of different ages, we often think of the young as being reckless, whereas the old being set in their ways. Another thing is that we often think of children as being particularly good at learning, whereas as adults, we think of them as being a lot better at exploiting. Or in other words, kids are very good at learning, but they're not very good at actioning what they've learned, whereas adults don't learn quite as quickly as kids, but they're very good at actually making decisions that are impactful. So overall, it's almost as if Mother Nature built these particular algorithms into us because of their optimal strategies. Though this isn't an excuse for adults to stop learning, nor is it an excuse for kids to make rash decisions, but what it can tell us is how age affects our decision making. And because these are very efficient solutions, what it tells us is that when we're young, we should spend more time relishing that kind of uncertainty and the options available to us to build up a bigger and more clear picture. And then when we have less time on our side, we should lean towards what we already know and settle on the things that we already enjoy because it doesn't make sense to put all our time into something when we don't actually have the opportunity to benefit from its findings. So some real world examples for how this whole explore exploit operates in the real world is online advertising, clinical trials, restaurant choices, product development, and many more. So that's it for this one. If you enjoyed this particular type of content, feel free to let me know as I've got many other concepts similar to these that I can delve into and explore how science, maths and economics can help us make very informed decisions in our everyday lives. As usual, if you got benefit from this video, I'd really appreciate if you leave a like, subscribe or a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.